save this so people can watch it later? Yep, yep. Oh, goody, because some of them said they, they can't watch it now. Okay, well, I'm gonna admit all. We have 29 waiting, so it's good. So here we go, we're admitting everybody. Hold on one second. Says recording live on okay. Facebook. Okay, yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeannie Ralston. Are we on Facebook? <laughs> There's people waving. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jeannie Ralston. I'm the co founder of Next Tribe. And every Thursday since we got into lockdown, we've been having events where we talk to authors. And now we get to speak to a wonderful artist and who is also an author and a journalist and a first time producer and director. She uh, launched her, uh, started working on her film, uh, Take My Nose, Please. You were, in, I think, in your late 80s, mid 80s? Mid 80s. Yeah. Mid 80s. And now at 92, she's joining us here to talk about her film, a new one she's working on, and her legendary career. It's uh, Joan Crone. Welcome, Joan. So glad you're here. Hi, Jamie. So nice to, Joan and I were at um, Allure together, though we never met, but I was there for eight years as a contributing editor. You were there for 25. You're like, you know, like the, <laughs> right. you were the idol everyone wanted to be. And I don't, I don't know if you saw, I, I wrote in a newsletter um, that I sent out about this event where I said, you're who we all want to be when we grow up. It's, we want to be, we want to have the kind of career, the kind of life that you've had. It's just amazing. You're such an inspiration. I don't know if you know it, but Next Tribe's motto is age boldly. And I just think whether you want to be or not, you're our poster child. So <laughs> oh, it's a terrible responsibility. <laughs> I'm sorry to put that on you. But for, so first, for, I've got to admit some more people. We've got some more people coming in. They're just coming, coming, coming. They all want to hear talk to Joan. Um, I am going to play a little, uh, uh, the trailer to her movie, which is about plastic surgery and she follows two women two comedians as they go for plastic surgery uh and they or they debate they decide on whether they will do it but let me share my screen wait 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 i have to do the technology thing hold on everyone <laughs> i'm sharing my screen don't look at my my cluttered screen and let's see share oh here we go let's see if we can see this if this works I hope everyone can see this. Big smile. I've always said that I have some unfortunate angles. I have a Jewish nose. I mean, ooh, that's probably offensive to people, but I'm Jewish, so. Was there any time you didn't like the way you looked? No, that would be a no. I was a rude, ugly, stupid, boring, spoiled child. And if you think I'm self-loathing now, you're lucky you didn't see the one woman show I did when I was five. You want to do something to your face? Yeah. A lift. What made you decide to have yourself done over? Well, I got sick and tired of having the dog drag me out in the yard and bury me. <laughs> Even though I'm considering it, it's still very grisly to me. It is a sort of like philosophical dilemma to alter your appearance just because you can. There's actually one class of celebrities that will be very honest about cosmetic procedures they've undergone. You don't look exactly like the Joan Rivers I used to know, and that would be comedians. I take that as a compliment. Yeah. Then I had uh, eyelids made, then I had a facelift, then I had a breast reduction, but being Jewish, they grew back. I don't know. How. <laughs> to me, it is just brainwashing, manipulation, and mutilation of women. gonna get it my surgeon he said oh now julie wear the soul of discretion i said discretion i'm tweeting it <laughs> i want to be cool to live in, to would you hire me now Wait, see it does look good this is the kind of change that we're talking about regardless of how you look people are going to judge you so you might as well like looking in the mirror <laughs>
<laughs> How wonderful is that? That's all, it, I still uh, love it when I watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I still laugh. Well, that's good. After seeing it, so how many times, huh? You've seen it like probably a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> so, I just want to know what brought you to make this movie. What what was the urge behind it? Well, I've been covering plastic surgery for twenty five years, and uh, well, at that point, I was I don't know what about. Uh, 18, 19, 20 years or something. And uh, I saw the handwriting on the wall. Uh, they, you know, I, I tend to write very long. <laughs> and every time I would hand in a story, they would, every, they would uh, at Allure, they would say, Joan, you're writing too long. <laughs> you know? And you have to cut. And I realized that uh, people uh, didn't want to read anymore. <laughs> and the, the stories were getting shorter. Maybe they were getting shorter because there was less advertising. <laughs> that was a problem too, uh, less pages in the magazine. So um, I was a talking head in somebody else's movie and uh, about plastic surgery. And when I went to the opening night at Lincoln Center, uh, it, because it was in the Lincoln Center Film Festival, I turned to my friend Susie, who, uh, who had the tickets and brought me along. I said, I could do that. <laughs> and and I, I had an idea, and I met some of the producers on that film, who then became the producers of my film. And uh, one thing led to another, and I took a, um, I ordered it, of course, at the School for Visual Arts. Uh, uh, it was a master's degree program and I just uh, was allowed to watch, come one Thursday, every Thursday night. Uh, they invited me and uh, by the time I got done, I had met all the top documentary filmmakers and, and I just said, I can do that. I want to do that. If, if I don't know how, I'll figure it out. I, I love that. That's the, that's the spirit that I always think of for our next tribe women is we say yes, we say yes to new challenges. But what, so what all did you have to learn to make this film? I mean, I, I imagine you, you I, I know you wrote the screenplay and the script and everything, but then, then what all? No, did there's no script. There's no script. Oh, it's, it's a documentary. But uh, the reason that I, I, I started out to do something else about a woman in Australia and it was a great story, but then I thought, oh my God, you know, going to Australia, do I need to add that expense to, <laughs> to this film? Maybe that's a little, bit biting off more than I can chew. And uh, I was sort of uh, floundering around for an idea and uh, I had my knee replaced because you know how old I am. You know, I'm 92, yes. and I've yes, we had have a lot to say of that. We're nine. She's I, 92. A lot guys. of spare parts. <laughs> <laughs> she is, like I said, we all want to grow. We just we want your life. That's me. It's okay. Amazing. Okay. I tell everybody my age because I, you know it's kind of fun. Yeah, um, you should be proud. <laughs> okay. So then, um, uh, my cousin. I, I have a cousin named Bill Sheft, who was a writer for David Letterman and he came to see me while I was recovering from my knee surgery. He came with his wife Adrian who was a, a comedian herself and I wanted to entertain them. You know they, they were very nice. They came to see me and so I said um, you know um, comedians are the only ones who talk about their plastic surgery and I said I've written a book about um, uh, the history of the facelift, and I have a section in the book about comedians. And I started telling them about uh, Fanny Bryce and uh, Joan Rivers and Toady Fields, uh, Phyllis Diller, and, and Bill Sheff looks at me and he says, well, Joan, that's your movie. And I said, well, of course. <laughs> and the minute they left, I went to my computer and I sat down and it was like magic writing. And I just typed out, take my nose, please. I, you know, because the, the, um, the most famous punchline in American comedy is take my wife, please. Right, right. And uh, it just came, it just it popped just, into my perfect. head at that moment. And I typed it 
And I said, oh, that's such a good title. Well, you know, you're a writer, Jeannie. If you get a good title for a story, you decide, I got to do it. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, so what did you want viewers to come away with when they, what, what's your, what was your thought? Like, okay, I'll make this documentary and I, I, I want people to think about this or this or that. What is, um, well, <laughs> Uh, I said, I have to find a, a, one of the directors that I met at that course that I audited. Mm -hmm. uh, I spoke to him about my idea and he said, well, you know, you cannot just make a movie about people who already have plastic surgery, like, you know, Joan Rivers. Right. You, it's a, do a documentary has to follow a story wherever it leads and you don't know the end when you start. And so you're gonna to have to find somebody, you're gonna to have to find a comedian. And I said, oh, okay, I can do that. <laughs> so I started going to comedy clubs. And the first time, the first comedy club I went to was ladies night. And there was a woman there uh, who was performing and her whole act was about her nose. And I said, my God, it's the first night in a comedy club and I found the person. So I stayed late and I, and I met her in the lobby. She was taking, you know, she was signing autographs or something, selling a, a I don't know, uh, selling a disc or something. And I, I met her and I said, I'm making a movie called Take My Nose, Please. And she said, oh my God, I've always wanted my nose done. I said, well, I, I kind of got that. <laughs> from your attack. And she says, let me think about this. And I'll call you, it was the weekend, I'll call you at the end of the weekend. She calls me on Monday and she says, I've decided not to do it because I don't want the first movie I'm in to be about my nose. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh I, okay. <laughs> then I knew it was going to be difficult. So I went to many, many co comedy clubs, many Diet Cokes, you know, you have to drink the minimum. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, this is hopeless, absolutely hopeless. I'll never find anybody. So then um, Bill suggested I go on the Upright Citizens Brigade uh, website. And I went on their website and they had all, you know, that, that's a comedy um, school. Oh, right. And uh, they, they, all their alumni are, were on there in little thumbnails. I don't think they have that anymore, but at that time, and they were alphabetical. So I started with A, and there were about 30 people in A. And each one had a tiny little postage stamp picture and a biography. And I started reading them. And one of them just kind of popped out at me, Emily Askin. And she said, I'm an expert on beauty. And that kind of intrigued me. And so I looked her up on, you know, I Googled her, of course. And, and I found she had a, a, a comedy troupe of other women. And anyway, I called her on the phone. And she, at that time, she owned a beauty salon because comedians always have to have another job, you know. Right. <laughs> and and um, when I called, I she thought I was calling because I said it was from Allure magazine. Oh. And she thought I was calling about her salon. Oh. No, I'm not calling about your salon. I'm making a movie called Take My Nose, Please. And she said, oh, I've always wanted to have my nose done. And he said, well, it could be arranged. And that was that. And then I, I brought it to New York. You know, send her a ticket on the plane. And I brought it to New York. And um, she introduced me to the other girls in her troupe and whatnot. And before you know it, um, she was willing to be in the, in the uh, movie. And then I thought, well, that's it. I've got that. And then a, a good friend of mine, Sue Roy, who may or may not be on watching today, <laughs> um, wrote to me and said, did you read the Wall Street Journal today? And I said, no, I have a subscription, but I didn't read it today. <laughs> she said, you have to read this story. Jackie Hoffman is, they did a profile of a comedian named Jackie Hoffman. And she said in it 
that she regrets not having the nose job her mother offered when she was 16, and she wouldn't mind having a facelift too. And oh, wow, so that's how you found them. Wow. And I and I I um, I googled her, and somehow I found her press agent or a manager, and in, in about two hours I was in touch with the manager, and the manager referred me to Jackie, and by the end of the day. Uh, uh, she was interested and, and she met me and I don't know, I guess I convinced her. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And I won't, we won't tell so for people to watch it, but you didn't know when you talked to them whether they were going to go through with it. And we won't say whether they did or not. I appreciate that. Don't tell them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't know. So you were just following along. And did you, I mean, in, in the trailer and, and it, it asked, is it vanity or empowerment? Do you right. have an opinion on that? I think it's both. <laughs> very um, diplomatic. It's, very, it's very hard to tease them apart. Uh, we hate to admit vanity, so very few people will admit vanity. Um, but it is vanity, uh, but it's more than vanity. Because, frankly, did anybody ever tell you, does anybody ever tell you when you don't look good? <laughs> People, when, yeah. when, when you look better, I, I, you know, I've had some face work. And it's amazing how people are so happy for you when you look better. And it's not that you changed your looks, but you maybe you took yourself back five years or you, you know, it was like having a great facial and a, and a good makeup artist. And people, people don't say when you look tired uh, or uh, sick or what, they don't say, oh my God, you look awful today. I, I mean, nobody ever compliments you on that, <laughs> but they do. I mean, you get a lot of attention when you look better. Right. And so, uh, that's a kind of empowerment. <laughs> and also, there's so many people, as women especially, who are going out for jobs, and they, when all things are equal, they pick the younger person. And it's, it's very sad. Now, I mean, the nose job is not an age, not necessarily something that makes you look younger, but it does look, often makes you look better. Right. Um, that's, and that's a value judgment, and I shouldn't be making a value judgment, but in your own, you know, most of the people are very happy who have nose jobs, about 95%. And the same thing with facelifts. So they're, they're very happy, and they see some benefit. And I saw a benefit. I, I don't believe that I would have been working for 25 years for a lure magazine if I aged the way I was going and was becoming to look like my grandmother. I really don't. I don't think that, I mean, we had a young audience and they want somebody who can relate to, the, or the audience can relate to. Right, right. So, well, um, I'm gonna just say here that every, we have a great group here and I want to ask you to uh, write your questions in chat and in a few minutes, I'm going to call on people and I'll unmute you so you can ask Joan questions directly. But I have a few more questions myself. Um, How do I look? How do I look? I've got, I've got a ring light today. You're so smart. You've got a ring this light. Is the first day that I have a ring light. I can't show it to you. You look wonderful. You look good. <laughs> it washes out everything. Yeah. So that's I, that's <laughs> a good, good move. So the thing that I've found when I was when I was watching it I had such I was torn in different directions like at the beginning I mean through it there was when you went and talked about uh Toady Fields and and Joan Rivers and Phyllis Diller they, I, my heart hurt for them I thought it was pretty it was kind of sad and then some of the experts talking about it made it me feel like oh you know I, I just didn't feel good about plastic surgery for these in the, in those instances but at the very end, you have people talking about what they've had done. And then I had a different, I was like, oh, it, it, was, it was like, oh, this is no big deal. So do you, I mean, do you, 
do you think it's a big deal? I mean, I guess, um, how do you square like the, the people who, who talk like uh, Jackie talked about self-loathing and that kind of thing. And, and some of the jokes that Phyllis Diller made and, and then some people being very light about it at the end. Is that, is there, how do you square that? Well, while we were filming, we asked the people that we were filming and we, we didn't really know some of them that well, you know, we didn't know any personal things about them. And, and we discovered that some of the talking heads had some work done. And, and of course, you know, I know I've had some work done and it's no secret. And so um, Nancy Novak, our editor said, let's, let's put these things in the, as a kind of a postscript. And so after the film was finished, we, we rented a photo studio and we invited everybody who worked on the film. And that's, I mean, the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the guy who did archival, the photographer, the sound man, um, the, the, several of the, we had a couple of videographers and whatnot, and the producers. We asked everybody yeah. to come to the studio and to answer one question on, on video. And we were totally surprised by the answers because we, there was no rehearsal. We didn't tell them what to say. And every one of them, I mean, I think that little ending is one of the funniest things in the movie. It is, it's pretty funny. It's, it's, a, right. it's, a, it's a unusual, it took, you know, I almost finished, you know, I almost paused it after the end, but then I'm so glad I kept it on because I got to, I wouldn't want to miss that. And I also like, we're getting some questions, so I'm going to get to people in a minute, but I also thought it was pretty brilliant to do this about comedians. I know why you said, because nobody else will talk about it, but also it made some of the really kind of hard, hard sentiments being expressed. Like Jackie Hoffman could talk about things that if she wasn't a comedian, you might be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but she was able to weave in some realism, some humor, some lightness. And so I think that that worked really well. Well, comedians are, are just so wonderful spontaneously. And so that was a great gift to me. I didn't realize what a gift it would be. But, you know, <laughs> they just, we were able to see the comedy in their own lives. They were, they were able to see the irony. And, and then, and Jackie, while we were filming, um, Jackie said, you know, I, I wrote a song. I'd like to send it to you. I said, oh, well, that would be nice. That would be very nice. And she said, and it took a while and when I got it, I almost fainted. It. it was so fantastic. <laughs> when the, the, you see a little bit of it on the trailer that you ran, that was she it, did that, she no, wrote what? that. She, she wrote that song about uh, um, uh, Santa. That um, what I want for Christmas is, <laughs> and um, it, it was just amazing. Uh, I, I couldn't believe it. And then, um, then ran, I remember Randy Rothenberg. I was having dinner with him, and he said. Um, you know, uh, on the, um, on Ma on the, what's that, Ma Mad Magazine once put out a record and they had, and they had a song. And so we were able to get a song about, uh, about plastic surgery from, from Mad Magazine. I mean, everything just fell into place. Yes. Well, I can, I, I can tell cause it, it's, and it has, you have great, animation and I was you know of course I'm looking at it going I know that's kind of expensive to get that kind of animation but oh it, yes, it works. Oh, yes. <laughs> but so, I tell you animation is just fabulous and in my next film we have a lot of animation oh good and we're, we're going same we're, animator good we are going to get get to that but I had one other question do you think it's changing I mean you've said that comedians are the only ones that talk about it their work but they're the only honest ones. Honest ones, but honest ones. Do you think that's changing? And why? Why comedians? Why do? Why do you think comedians are honest? Because they, they, they their whole act is always about their life. I mean, 
and they're just honest about everything. Right. And people call it, they're, I mean, maybe we should call them tragedians, you know? I mean, it's, some of it is tragic. Right. Like, they, they, they mine all the terrible things and all the anxieties and all the uh, unfortunate uh, events, and, and they use that in their, to entertain us, but it's, it's more than entertainment, it's education. Yeah, it reveals more, it reveals something about the human condition because there's so many of us who might really feel like when Jackie's talking about self-loathing, maybe, you know, there's parts of us remembering things we really hate about ourselves or whatever, but uh, but do you think that it's changing, that people are more, even, you know, beyond comedians are willing to be honest about it? I think that there's more honesty in a small circle of friends. I mean, I think it used to be that women hid it from their friends. Now I think they tell their friends, but I don't think they make announcements like the way I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I felt I owed it to my readers, frankly. I, I you know, I, I didn't think that it was proper for me in my position as covering plastic surgery for Allure um, to lie about it. I think that's not fair. So. Well, that that is that's a good journalist then, and um, and also it, I think it's good to be honest because I think if you know if if you haven't had plastic surgery or you and you see somebody who's looking so good and you're like, wah wah, you know, <laughs> I'm like, what's wrong with me? But it makes you you kind of can understand. Well, yes, it's very I mean, it's very unfair when a woman disappears and comes back and says. I've just been to a spa and I've just, you know, I've just been doing yoga every day and eating healthy. And I, you know, and everybody says, bye, you look great. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's not fair to your friends. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not fair because then you can feel really, really like bad about yourself. But I don't think they're really going out and announcing it in front of a microphone. You've got the microphone behind you. <laughs> Okay, so I just, we're getting, to, we've got so many, um, so many questions. Let's see, I'm going to have people unmute themselves because I'm not, um, I'm not going to be able to find you. So I like this one here, Gabby Shack, Shackmai, you had a question. Can you unmute yourself, Gabby? Hi, hi, Joan. Um, I yeah. am so curious to hear your thoughts on Kellyanne Conway's recent transformation. <laughs> well, I want that program. <laughs> that's all i need to I, program, I, I haven't i haven't seen it i'm gonna I, clipped. oh maybe i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna google while we're talking i'm gonna google it but um uh, see what she looks like new look oh it's the first thing that comes up kellyanne conway new look oh really wow okay well didn't he disappear for two weeks at least um maybe if she dis if we haven't seen her in two weeks, it's possible that is surgery, but it, it's also something that might come up in some kind of a look better program on the internet. Well, let's let's do it. Let's do a screenshot, and uh, I mean a screen share. I mean, was this just something on in on the internet, or is this something that was a photograph taken in person? No, here's a here's uh, a picture. Can people see this? Oh, please. Well, that, yeah, that's a, that's a really nice facelift. That she is probably went to the same person Melania went to. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll stop sh I'm sharing. I just wanted to see, I hadn't seen it, but yeah, I'm, she does look good, I have to say. Um, so I all, let's see, we have other questions too. Patrice, you had a question. Can you unmute yourself? Or comment, I guess. If she's there, but maybe she's not. Maybe she can't hear me. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, so a lot of people want to know about your next movie. You're working on something right now, right? I am. I'm working on. I'm not telling the title, and I'm not telling uh, the unique way that we're doing it. But <laughs> but I'll tell you what it's about. Okay. Uh, it's about the history of Botox. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Okay. And 
so what can you tell us about it then? You don't want to tell us the title. I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to tell too much about it. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I'm in it, I'll tell you that. Um, there will be a lot of animation um, because it's a very long story. <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, a botox is basically um, a bacteria turned into a toxin that's called botulinum toxin that has a very long history and uh, quite an interesting history. And uh, in order to make it uh, less, um, I don't know, less academic, but more, more interesting, more engaging, uh, we're using animation in some sections and that's all I can tell you. <laughs> and well, when do you, when and do you we do have interest from a major, major streamer and uh, we're preparing right now, we're coming to the end of a sizzle reel that we're making, which is a, a, a seven minute reel with a kind of a pitch for the movie. And I'm in that too. And it's quite interesting. I, that's all I can say, I'm okay. sorry. When do you think you will, it'll be out or, I mean, when do Well, you I don't think it's gonna be out for a year and a half because well, first we have to sell it and then we have to make it make the film I mean we've done a lot of shooting already but uh, we're only using parts of the, sh the shoots that we've done in this uh, little sizzle reel but uh, I, I'm the wonderful thing about having take my nose please is that when I was making take my nose please I couldn't get anybody very few people to invest a, a very a few very good friends invested, and uh, I must say that I invested too. <laughs> so it was very hard to raise money. Let's just put it that way. Uh, my age uh, was a deterrent. People, you know, I think people thought, is she going to live <laughs> you know, to finish it? And then uh, I never had made a film before, and so everybody thought I was going to fail. And first movies are rarely successful. Um, and then um, a lot of people did not want to be associated with a plastic surgery movie because as one investor said, I invest in documentaries all the time, but if I invest in this one, people will suspect I had a nose job, which I did and I've never told anybody. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right. So, and uh, other, uh, somebody else, um, a, a professor at NYU uh, who uh, looked at the, at the, what you saw, the, um, the, the uh, uh, trailer and said, it's really uh, engaging and it looks very interesting, but I don't approve of plastic surgery. Oh. So I don't want to uh, help you with it. Or I, I, I guess I was asking her for advice or something. And um, she, she doesn't approve of plastic surgery. So I had to deal with that. Yeah. yeah. And then the film came out, and I'm not shy about telling you that I got an award at the, oh. the first film festival that I was in was the Miami Film Festival. And this is the Night Documentary Achievement Award for Take My Nose, Please. And it came with ten thousand dollars. Oh my gosh! Which helped, a, which helped a great deal with the animation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I did not get an Oscar. I did not get an Oscar, <laughs> but a friend, a friend of a friend, gave me this little Oscar because we did enter the Oscars and we qualified. And I and because I made a film that a lot of people like. I was able to get producing partners on my next film, on my Botox film, and I'm working with the documentary group, which is a, like a movie studio of documentaries, and it was started by Peter Jennings. Oh, wow. Uh, late Peter Jennings. And uh, so it's, a, they're very, it, it's great because they're taking a lot of the uh, back office off of my uh, back and so I, I, I'm free to just be creative. I can't, I can't wait for, for that. Um, Fran, ha, Fran Carpentier, do you want to unmute yourself? You have a question. 
one, I, let me just say, I loved the film. I was very privileged to see it uh, at the opening in New York City. And I just wondered, you know, after people participated, and of course they all were comedians and, you know, celebrities, entertainers, did anyone later have any regrets? Like, did they tell you this was not a good idea? You know, I'm just, I'm curious about that. No, no regrets. No regrets. I, I would have to tell you how the film ends and I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it for people because yeah. although it's a documentary, when you watch it, it's almost like a dramatic film. You're really sitting, I, because we screened it a lot, you know, to get comments while we were editing it. And people were like, I could watch them actually sitting on the edge of their seats getting so nervous and and I had one doctor here and he said I'm so nervous I don't know what to do what's she going to do <laughs> so I don't want to tell you but I can tell you if anybody did anything there were no regrets in fact they wanted more <laughs> right. and more. they were thinking and I've I, I've heard that people if they have it they end up wanting some more because they like it so much so they liked it so much yes yeah. well and i am um next tribe is definitely we are neutral on a, that whether you know we don't have an i mean as a magazine we don't or we don't have an opinion whether people should get it or not i think it's kind of thing that everybody has to make their own decision and it's whatever when we say age boldly that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't color your hair or whatever it means age the best that you can the way that you want and i think that is is that more of the, the sentiment these days i mean you, you ran into no. somebody who didn't like who wouldn't invest or help you no Jeannie, that's a great question i mean i am not i'm not pushing plastic surgery i mean some people think i'm pushing plastic surgery i have written so many stories about the bad effects of uh, dangers of plastic surgery. I wrote a story at the lore about women who are uh, people who have murdered their plastic surgeons, you know. Uh, I mean, I, I, I have explored the good side and the bad side. I don't, I can't speak for anybody. I have dear friends who have not had a thing and I never ever say to somebody, you need this. You, nobody needs it. You have to decide for yourself. But the one thing I can tell you is, if there is science that makes something available, people are gonna take advantage of it. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's never been a development that could benefit people that they just said, oh, I'm not going to do it for ethical reasons. Right, right. I just yeah. believe I, 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 there are some people who don't take advantage of it, but there are more who do. <laughs> right, right, yes. And so. well, I, 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 you know, I, I think my feeling about it is I, I, I wouldn't, and I think somebody said this in the, in the film, like, oh my God, what if I died get for van, you know, like I'd be so embarrassed for my family. <laughs> I said the same thing when I had when I had my face done. I said it would be so embarrassing <laughs> to die of plastic surgery. But there are there are risks every day. There is a risk in crossing the street. Right. I mean, so uh, there's a risk on getting a plane on a plane. You have to weigh wh how what it means to you, and it's not all vanity. People judge people on their appearance. And when they start aging, I mean, look at all the jokes you see all the time about old people. Mm. Yeah. I mean, really, I get so annoyed when, and even, you know, I, I might be sitting and talking to friends and then they say, you know, he's 80 years old. I said, so what? Yeah. <laughs> I, I said, I'm 90. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm more than 90. Oh my God, I'm 92. <laughs> well, and I see several people have written in um, saying that they, they'd be willing to be subjects if you haven't, if you're ever doing another one. Hattie was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to be a subject? 
Hattie's waving her hand. <laughs> Hattie, just tell us really quickly. Oh, she's, I can't unmute her. I can't hear you. Oh. <laughs> anyway, oh, there you are, Hattie. I became a model in my 70s, and I never had a very straight nose, but the rest of me kind of made up for it. But when I was in Milan for a TV program, I felt, and I got an extra bump on my nose, so I don't stop fantasizing having a nose job. <laughs> well, yeah. oh, oh, you're beautiful, especially with purple lips. My goodness, <laughs> how could you do that? And she's great. She's been to some of our events, Hattie. You're you're wonderful. So I'll, the other thing I want to talk about, um, and if people have questions about the, your films, that's one thing. But I want to talk about your long career because you won an award for being a journalist for fifty years or something. Didn't you win a just recently win an award, a, 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 some kind of tribute? Yes. Well, I didn't start writing until I was, I think, forty one or two. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I started writing on a fluke. I, I wanted, I set out in life to be a costume designer in the theater. And originally I set out to be a, design the circus. And I, I went to the Yale Drama School and, um, and I, for my second year project there, I did a circus parade and they hung, they hung the whole parade. I did about 50 pages, 50 plates or whatnot. They call them plates, but they're, you know, paper. <laughs> they hung it all over the school when I did it. And so everybody in school knew that I wanted to do a circus parade. So uh, when I was, after I graduated, I worked at NBC television as a costume designer. I worked on Howdy Doody. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I did not know that. Doody show, and I was in charge of Clarabelle. I didn't design his costume, but I had to make his ruffs. I had to make three new ruffs a week because he perspired and they, they got saggy. Yeah. And so, um, so I was in charge of him and I was in charge of all modern dress in, in all the dr drama things. And in, we made breakaway suits for Milton Berle because we put snaps on and then the sleeves would come off when he had a fight. I mean, that's what we did. It, it, it was live television. And uh, when I was working there and I was just engaged to be married to a doctor in Philadelphia, and I got a recommendation from one of my classmates to be the assistant to, the, to, to Miles White, who was the designer of the uh, Ringling Brothers Circus. Oh, wow. So I went to the interview and I said, look, I'm moving to Philadelphia. It takes two and a half hours on the train. That's, this was 1950. <laughs> two and a half hours on the train. That would be five hours a day commuting back and forth to work with you. I don't think I can do it. And so I'm going to have to say no, and this is my dream job. And, you know, and I, I always regretted what would have happened if I had worked for the circus. Well, I would have married a clown or something. <laughs> but um, anyway, I, I, I had a very interesting life in Philadelphia. I made an interesting life there, and that's a whole other, a whole other show. So we can't go into that now. But um, I wasn't, I was not doing anything. I was uh, what I call the culture commissar. I was um, working as a volunteer in an organization called the Arts Council and bringing um, culture to Philadelphia, that uh, very avant-garde things. And I was always getting in trouble. I brought Andy Warhol and underground films and the Velvet Underground. And I was always doing things that people were angry at. So. I had quite a lot of fun. <laughs> and so but, and, I, and I, as I say, I started writing when I was 41 because somebody, some uh, young men were starting an underground newspaper in Philadelphia. And they said, well, you know everybody in the underground and you, you know everybody in society. So we want you to be the society editor. And I said, well, I can't write. And they said, and this was Lee Eisenberg who became the editor of Esquire. Hello. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And he said, 
um, he said, well, everybody can write. So I said, well, I have a typewriter, I'll try it. And I had a friend who was growing marijuana in her backyard in Villanova, a very elegant suburb. <laughs> and um, and I, when I finished the story, I said, I think I can write. And then they lost their backer. So I took it to Philadelphia Magazine, um, where I knew the editor because we used to play bridge together. And he thought I was frivolous. <laughs> And um, and the minute he read my story, he hired me. And that was that. And that's how I became a writer. And I said, well, I'm going to go to journalism school. And he said, no, you don't go to journalism school. They'll ruin you. You're a natural. I'm going to teach you everything you need to know. And Alan Halpern was the editor. He's fantastic. He's dead now. Everybody's dead now. And, uh, <laughs> and he... Um, he did teach me a lot, and then I was hired by Clay Felker. I, I, I complicated. I, my daughter died. I got a divorce. I moved back to Philadelphia, I mean, to New York, and Clay Felker hired me at New York Magazine, and then Rupert Murdoch stole the magazine, and then I was hired by the New York Times. It's a long story. <laughs> but, wow, but see, this is great, because I, I do feel like that women can have many different careers and we, you know we and everything that we learn culminates it, it, it can all come together you don't waste anything like things you learn early on can play a part later like you never you never expect do you agree well um you know i've had an interesting life i mean i'm not sure that i want everybody to copy my life because I had a lot of pain in my life. But, um, uh, you know, the good things came out of it. I have three wonderful stepchildren. I have my own son and, uh, and all their spouses and, the, and the, I, well, my grandchildren, I have great grandchildren, you know, so uh, everything worked out. <laughs> And now I'm just trying not to get the coronavirus. Yes, please. And, and as somebody in the comments reminded me that you invented the phrase, you coined the phrase high tech, which is, right? Well, I didn't coin it. I, I like to say I picked it up off the cutting room floor. It was, it was, it was used very rarely and to describe prefab buildings. And when Susie Slesson and I um, wrote a, a book about decorating with industrial objects, we chose high tech to be the title. And then it, it, we popularized the term and it went into the Oxford English Dictionary where we are mentioned, Susie and I are mentioned by name in the Oxford English Dictionary for giving new meaning to the to the term high tech, so I'm very proud of that. You should be. Wow. <laughs> so uh, this is one question I have, and you can talk to all of us. I mean, you seem like the perfect person to say this to. How do you make such a life? Like, how do you keep going? What is it that keeps you going and, and striving and, and not stopping at 92? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I think curiosity. I just think, uh, I love journalism. I love what I do because I can, it, I'm more interested in reading when I'm learning something about, that I'm curious about. Right. And so I have no problem. I love doing research. Uh, and that's because it, I, I think pr maybe it's because I, you know, I went to um, college originally to Carnegie Tech for one year because they had a course called costume economics. And I, I thought maybe I'd learn, you know, become a costume designer and I didn't realize it was really home economics. Oh, <laughs> and then, wow. And I, I might learn how to sew, which I knew how to do already anyway. Um, but, um, I, uh, I transferred, I, I wasn't happy there, and I wanted, I decided, I, by then I knew a little more, and I wanted to go to a drama school where I could study costume design. And I didn't want to go to a wonderful drama school at Carnegie Tech, 
uh, it's now Car Carnegie Mellon, you know, in, in those days it was Carnegie Tech. And because they insisted that everybody on every department had to be in place and nobody believes me, but I was just very, very shy. <laughs> I was so shy I could not speak in public. Yes, no, we can't believe that. <laughs> no, nobody believes me. So I said, well, I can't go to Carnegie Tech because even though I, I love all the girls in the school and whatnot, so I transferred to the Yale Drama School at Yale University, and that's a, that is a graduate program. So I have no degree. I, not, I don't have a bachelor's degree. I, don't, I did a master's degree program three years and it's i can transfer it if i ever haha ha, get a <laughs> bachelor's degree which i don't think i'm getting right, <laughs> right now and um and so i i'm always fighting the idea that i'm really not smart <laughs> mm -hmm. i call myself a an idiot savant that's it because i always say i didn't graduate any i mean i graduated from yale but not with a degree, <laughs> even though I did all the work. That's crazy. That's crazy. Right. So I just feel like I have to prove myself. <laughs> so. And do you, have you ever rested on your laurels? Like, ah. No, I never, no, never. I, I'm, I'm always insecure. <laughs> well, well, I think that, I, I think that curiosity being a driving force and creating this kind of life because you and do you um like what do you say to yourself like when you thought about doing a film did you ever have this voice saying you can't do that or do you not have that or do you know how to talk to that little self-doubt voice um i get i i had many moments i'm sure there are people in the audience who have talked me down from the ledge on when I was making Take My Nose. I, I can assure you I had many bad moments, but I also had some people that recommended that I talk to this one or talk to that one. I, they were very nice people. And one thing that I did that helped me when I made Take My Nose is that when I started, um, Somebody told me I could get in the I could get into it for very little money. I said, "Oh well, I could take some of my savings and do that." I said, "I didn't think it would cost much, you know." And anybody who worked for me, I paid them on the spot. I paid them the day they worked, and so people were willing to work for me for less because they were being paid right away. Because this, you know how you know how hard it is for freelancers, right? Yes. And so, and I've been a freelancer in my life and I, I just didn't want to take advantage of people. And so when I started out, a lot of very talented people helped me. And um, eventually I found an, a miraculous way to pay for the film, but I can't go into that now. <laughs> okay. I think that is a secret. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, I, I... Um, but yes, I, I was always insecure, but but I had some kind of confidence because I had, you know, I, I don't know. I have confidence and I have not confidence. I, I well, have both of them. <laughs> I, I wonder if, if, if you had the... Um, Somebody put on the screen they, that I started drug cartel. <laughs> are you, that's your next thing? <laughs> um, I just wonder if you have the confidence, you, a lot of the confidence you do have is that knowledge that you've done so much already and you know if you're in a tight spot you you can remember oh i i, I was i dealt with that kind of thing before and i'm going to get through this so um is that do you ever feel that like i got this? at this point i i have confidence i mean i've written four books i i've lasted 25 years at condi nest which is a record that is, it must be. <laughs> um, I've won a, a, you know, some a few journalism awards. I don't know, fifteen or twenty. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, but you know, not the Pulitzer, not the big ones. No, 
Well, you know, I did get a lifetime achievement award from the plastic surgeons. <laughs> um, but um, I don't know, you know, once I, once I conquered writing and conquered my fear of writing uh, and had confidence in that I could write a headline, <laughs> um, I, I have enough confidence that carries me through. And I, I can just sit down and write on demand. I don't have to wait for inspiration. Although I keep a pencil next to my bed and I do wake up a lot in the middle of the night with some, you know, and write ideas down, and some of them are my best ideas. But um, no, I, you know, I think I put in enough time in my, in my trade, that, I, you know, I can, I can say I'm a writer. <laughs> Yay! And we have a, a question for for Patrice. Patrice, do you want to unmute yourself? Because I can't find you. There's so many people here. I can't find you. Last, because she. There we, we have go. a lot of people. <laughs> Oh, nice. Lots of people. Did I hear you at the beginning saying that you had gone to the new school or to the School of Visual Arts at the beginning of this conversation? No, um, I, I audited the, the uh, course at the School of Visual Arts. That's where I went to college back in 1968. It's a wonderful school. It's it a was. wonderful school, it yes. So, right. you know, I'm just, I'm just admiring listening to you. I try not to think about what could have been. I, I'm not a coulda, woulda, shoulda person. But right. listening to you, man, it's got me thinking, you know, the people that I knew and the people that I ran around with and uh, Halston. Well, and, no, uh, even I, when you don't, even when you don't, you know, when I, when I gave up costume design, I, I, I was by then in the, I was in the Scenic Artists Union in New York. You can't work on Broadway if you're not in the union. And you, in order to get in the union, you have to take a test. And it's, you can't just join when you go to have a job, union? but you have to actually take yeah. a written test and you have to draw while you're in the test room. You have to draw a costume, you know, okay. paint a costume design and whatnot. And so I was in the union, which is a, you know, a wonderful achievement. And when I gave up costume design, I thought I've wasted all those years, but I didn't realize how much of the whole drama school uh, experience, you know, doing costumes for the uh, plays in, the, in, the, in school um, prepared me to work with all these uh, creative people on the movie. Mm -hmm. And so I, I feel that I've really gone back to my roots uh, even though I didn't study uh, video, but you know, making a movie is very much like putting on a play. So it's yeah, not I studied different. stage design at School of Visual Arts. That's what I wanted to do. Really? Yeah. yeah. It's a wonderful. It's it a, whatever you study, you can use in the next career. That's what I found. And um, we, that's, yeah, what I was saying earlier about nothing seems to be wasted in in. If, in our lives and we should be we should value that kind of all of our experiences because they do they can really add up we've got a lot more questions i'm going to try to like we're, we're almost out of time but somebody asks i'm going to sybil asked do you experience any ageism um let me um i i i don't pay attention to it i just go i just barrel on through and I just, you know, tell everybody my age. And I thought when I'm when I was introduced by somebody to the documentary group, I was a kind of surprised because I mean I had this idea I'd been working on for a long time about the Botox film. And uh, I met this woman who had uh, through a, a mutual friend, and uh, I asked her if she would read my proposal, and she said I. I'm going to introduce you to some people you need producing partners. And, and uh, she said, please send it all to the people at the documentary group. So I sent it in and they asked me to come in for a meeting. And I came in for a meeting and I was just amazed that they, they didn't ask me about my age. You know, I, I walked in with a cane. I mean, I, I use a cane when I, when I walk on the street. I walked in with a cane. Now, I mean, 
it, even though I dye my hair, um, you know, I can't hide the fact that I'm old. And, and they didn't seem to care. They liked my idea. And by the time I finished the meeting, they had, they had watched Take My Nose, Please, and they loved it. And, they, I, and I said to them, are we engaged? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, kind of. <laughs> and, you know, and eventually we did sign a little agreement. <laughs> so, and I'm, so I can't say that with, <laughs> I suffered ageism. I maybe, I mean, and Linda Wells kept me on the staff until I was, until after she left, you know. <laughs> Right. She said, as long as I, as long as I could, you know, I had my memory, she, I was going to be employed. <laughs> I mean, that's just fabulous. You, you have to be a little, you have to do a little extra when you're older. I mean, you have to try harder. I think maybe, maybe I tried harder, but, um, you know, I, I fulfilled my obligations to the company. I, I helped everybody. I, I love working with young people. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, am guilty of ageism because I don't like to be with old people. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them, because I don't, want to, I don't want them to act old. That's all. Mm -hmm. If they act old, I don't want to be with them. And, and so how, that's such an interesting thing. What is it? How do you define acting old and how can we avoid it? <laughs> well, it's just talking about what hurts you every, I mean, there are a lot of pains and aches and, and a lot of things to complain about. I try not to focus on those things. I don't even read about them sometimes. I don't want to know. <laughs> yeah. And I think humor, I mean, definitely you have a sense of humor. And I think that's, and from the beginning of, for Next Drive, we've always tried to keep the humor because my mother, who's 91, has said, if you get older without a sense of humor, there's no hope for you. So anyway, so and by, I have to say my mom, when I told her about you, she was like, and my mom's a, you know, she's so energetic. She does so much and she's wonderful, you know, and but when I told her what you've done, she was like, Oh, maybe I'll feel bad if I, if that I'm not doing enough. So anyway. Well, you know, everybody says to me, uh, everybody says to me, I want you to meet my mother. Or I want you to meet my father, you know, uh, we, they're 92. And I, 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 say, I don't want to meet them <laughs> <laughs> because most of the time they are not active. I mean, I only want to, I only want to hang out with people who are doing things because otherwise it drags me down. Oh, that's a great, a great. I, I mean, I don't care how old they are if they're engaged, right. engaged in, in life and projects. I love people who have projects. I help, I try to help all my friends who have projects. Yes. Good. And I have, uh, Probably, I, you know, I, I get very bossy about their projects too. Well, <laughs> probably uh, we'll have one more question and then we're running over time, but this is just so amazing. And I'm not, I'm just going to ask it so we can be in the interest of time, but she says, uh, Kay Croner, and I don't know your first name. Um, Karen Croner, oh, my niece. Oh, your niece. Okay. She says, what do you say to the young The most talented woman you can imagine. A great screenwriter. Oh my gosh. Okay. Hi there. Uh, she says, what do you say to younger women who feel like ageism is stopping them? Women at 50 freaking out, I mean. Well, I think that they're, they're, they're coming to the moment where um, they're looking their age and they're getting age discrimination. And uh, that's the moment when uh, you know, it's the moment when you have to choose between aging gracefully or aging disgracefully. And I age disgracefully. <laughs> well, we like to say aging boldly. That's what I'm <laughs> oh, Okay. <laughs> but don't you, do you think that, I mean, that you've... You no, make, I, I, I just call it disgraceful. That's right. So, that's so funny. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Wow, we could go on and talk, and I feel terrible because there's so many questions I still have, and I'm sure people have, and I'm sorry if I didn't get to everybody's question, but 
Joan, we could just, as you say, we could do like, we could have a series where we talk about different careers you've had, different elements of your life, and you're, you're quite an inspiration. And I'm just gonna unmute everyone so we can all kind of give claps and cheers. Hold on one second. We can all clap and cheer for her, for Joan. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank, you. For, thank you for giving up your time. So much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Nice to see time. men. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm so lonesome. I'm so lonesome here. I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I've been, I've been indoors for three months. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I'm scared to go. I'm going out tomorrow on my scooter. Oh, <laughs> I, 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 have, I have a golden age scooter. Where do you oh live, Joan? What, what state do you live in now? I live in New York City. Oh, what street, if I can ask? What part of, what part of Manhattan? 63rd and 3rd. Nice. Oh, your nice. Town. No, your town's a little further up. 63rd and 3rd. Yes. Near, oh, near Serendipities. <laughs> hey, wait. wait. Well, oh. Joan, thank you so much. Be, be careful out on your, on your scooter, but I ha I'd love to see a picture of you on your scooter. <laughs> I wish I could see all the people there. Can, 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 you put, uh, can you put it on gallery or do you have it on gallery? She's on her phone. Oh, you are, are you on your phone? Oh, I'm on my phone. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't know how Our to take the pins. Hey, Jeannie, oh, no. Jeannie no, you no. know how um, Melissa takes a picture when we do the coffee oh, thing with no. everybody? Oh, yes. Can you what take a shots oh, for her? Here. I will do it. What have I done? Oh, I've done something terrible. I don't know. I've lost <laughs> you all. I've got <laughs> Oh, you do? I'm, Joan, I'm taking, um, we've got, I'm doing the gallery view and I'm going to send you the, the, the pictures. Look at all your, some people are not, they don't have their picture on, but uh, I have no picture or I don't know how to do this. There are people uh, <laughs> waving at you. Oh. Uh, anyway, I hope that you get out. You can be out more and be safe. And we, we thank, you. thank you so much, Joan. And I'll, I'll be in touch. I'll send you these pictures and all of you, I'll send you, a follow-up email with oh, there with the link to this recording and and so forth so thank you my love to manhattan yes okay. me too <laughs> take care all Jerry and Paul here we love you bye bye, bye. 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 oh